Hi, my name is Daud and I welcome you all to Ship Jyoti Online Classes. Today, together, we are going to study together English Literature. Chapter 11, it's called The Little Square Box. It's on page number 118. So, should we start? Are you ready? Let's go. So, before we start the chapter, we would first like to know about the writer because that is something we always do and that is something very important that we always do and that's something we will never stop doing. So, let's see. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a British writer famous for his stories about the brilliant detective Sherlock Holmes. Sounds familiar? I'm sure you have heard about Sherlock Holmes and you have read uh, the detective stories of Sherlock Holmes before and you, have, you must have watched it on TV also. The stories broke new ground in crime fiction. His other works include fantasy and science fiction stories, plays, romances, poetry, non-fiction and historical novels. Some of his other famous books are The Lost World and The White Company. So the story that we are going to study now is written by Sir Arthur Charles uh, sorry, Sir Arthur Conan, and he is a British writer, which means he's from Britain. Uh, he's an English, uh, uh, you know, his uh, his uh, nationality is of uh, Britain. Uh, he's, a, he's a British human being, and the uh, the stories he is also the writer of famous. He's famous for his stories of uh, Sherlock Holmes, and uh, there are several other stories which he has written. And some of his famous books are. The Lost World and The White Company. Now we are going to get into it. We are going to get inside the chapter now. So if you want to understand it better and if you want to feel it in a better way, if you want to uh, understand the perspective of the writer, then you need to imagine that you are there. You need to assume that you are a part of the story yourselves. Okay. So let's see. The speaker is a nervous man traveling from America to England on board the ship Spartan. He sees two men board the ship at the last minute and is immediately suspicious of the strange object they are carrying and they are secretive and their secretive manner. What are the two men planning? Will the speaker be able to stop them? Read on to solve the mystery of that little square box. So that's how the story begins. <coughs> Sorry. That's how the story begins. Uh, the speaker, the writer, you know, he, he, he is about to start his journey on a ship. He's, uh, he's about to be, uh, he's about to, uh, you know, on board the ship and he's traveling from America to England. Okay, imagine that you are this person and you are on the ship and suddenly you have noticed two strange human beings, two strange persons and they are carrying this little square box with them and that has made you suspicious you have started to doubt and what is inside that little square box we will find out as we will advance further in this story so please be with me don't go anywhere we were fairly started upon our voyage there was a general rush among the passengers in search of birds a pile of luggage was lying on one side of the deck awaiting their turn to be taken below. With my usual love for solitude, solitude, I walked behind these and sat on a coil of rope between them and the vessel's side. So, <clears throat> the narrator is saying, uh, so many passengers are there and their luggage with them too. And as usual, uh, with my love for solitude, which means uh, the narrator, the writer likes to spend time uh, you know, uh, with his own self, the like the writer likes to spend time, you know, when nobody is around, and he likes to be lonely. He likes to be alone, and that's how he enjoys it the most. So he is enjoying his solitude, and he's just roaming around there, and he's observing, and he's seeing other passengers coming and going, and on the deck, uh, their luggage is also there. I was aroused from my daydreams by a whisper behind me, here is a quiet place, said the voice, sit down and we can talk it over in safety. So he, was, he said that he was daydreaming, he was busy, he was lost in his thoughts and you know enjoying the solitude, enjoying the solitude and suddenly he heard whisper and that's how he got you know, uh, he came back to the place he was, 
because he was daydreaming and here is a quiet place said the voice sit down and we can talk it over in safety he heard this whisper from behind him imagine this situation you are here and somebody behind you is whispering this is the quiet place here is the quiet place sit down we can take it out in safety here somebody uh, someone you know some you know it was maybe one person or two person we will find out as we will advance further in the story uh, glancing through a gap between two colossal chests I saw that the passengers who had joined us at the last moment were standing on the other side of the pile they had failed to see me as I crouched in the shadow of the boxes so he just noticed that there are two passengers who joined them at the last moment at the 11th hour they came and they joined other passengers on the ship and they were there and it you know these two passengers were the ones who were whispering behind the speaker behind the narrator of the story the one who had spoken was a tall and a very very thin man with a blue black beard and a colorless face his manner was nervous and excited his companion was a short little fellow with a brisk air they both glanced around uneasily and if it took and if uh, as if to make sure they were alone so uh, he heard the whisper and it, it 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 was it came from two men one was very tall and he was nervous and excited at the same time and the other one was small you know he was in, she was short in height and he was also a very practical kind of a person and they were excited about something and they were nervous about something at the same time what was it what were they hiding we will find out in the story let's be with the detective well muller said the taller of the two we have got it abroad right enough tall one uh, said to the short one you know taller guy is uh, addressing the other person well muller we have got it aboard right now right enough yes agreed the man whom he had addressed as muller it was rather a near go it wouldn't have done to have missed the ship no it would have put our plans south let me see it is no one looking no they are nearby no they are nearly all below so this is the conversation between the uh, tall guy and the short guy uh, both of them are talking and they are talking about oh god we could almost miss the ship we were almost you know we were going to miss the ship we were this close we would have missed the ship and if we would have missed the ship it wouldn't have been a good thing for us that thank god that we, we were able to uh, you know get on board the ship and they also they are also trying to find out is no one looking is there anyone is there anyone keeping an eye on us they are being so careful and what are they hiding what is it with them here you can see the pictures of those two people those two passengers this is muller the short one and this is the other guy that the tall man and here is our narrator the uh, the writer the speaker who is observing all this he heard the whisper he was uh, spending some uh, time with his own self he was enjoying the solitude he was just lonely and thinking and daydreaming that's when he heard the whisper of these two men and let's see what will happen in the story next we can't be too careful where so much is at stake uh, flanagan and muller and and laid a dark object upon the deck one glance at it was enough to cause me to spring to my feet with an exclamation of horror luckily they were so engrossed in the matter on hand that neither of them observed me so these two people are so much into what they are talking that they could not notice the narrator they could not pay attention on the speaker you know uh, and they had this box in their hand and the narrator says that luckily they couldn't find out that i was observing them from the first moment of their con conversation i had felt a horrible sense of misgiving it seemed more than confirmed as i gazed at what they at what lay before me it was I, it was a little square box made of some dark wood it reminded me of a pistol case only it was much higher there was a trigger like arrangement upon the lid to which a coil of string was attached beside this trigger there was a small square opening through the wood the tall man 
Flanagan, as his companion called him, peered in for several minutes with an expression of intense anxiety upon his face. So now he is describing about the box. And they have this box with them, and the the tall guy and his name is Flanagan. Flanagan is uh, looking inside the box, and there is anxiety, which means there is tension on his face. And this is what the uh, observe. This is where. Uh, this is who who is observing this. The narrator is observing all this. That Flanagan is uh, looking inside the square box, and he looks. Uh, and uh, full of anxiety his uh, uh, expression the expression on his face is of anxiety which means he is taking some t tension and this box also reminded the narrator uh, of, of a pistol box of a pistol case he's thinking what if there is gun there is pistol inside the box it seems right enough he said at last I tried not to shake it, said his companion. Such delicate things need delicate treatment, put in some of the needful Muller. So they are talking about the box now, that such delicate things need uh, delicate treatment. You need to treat uh, delicate things with delicacy and put in the needful now. Then the Muller, the, the short guy, he is uh, putting something inside that little square box. And what is that? We will find out in the story as we will advance further. Then we have the shorter man looked in his pocket for some time and then produced a small paper packet. He opened this and took out half a handful of grains which he poured down through the hole. A curious clicking noise followed, when, uh, followed from the inside of the box and both the men smiled in a satisfied way. So there is a as, as he was asked to take out something and give to the you know put inside the box he asked uh, to take out the needful and give the needful he took out a paper from his pocket like this imagine that this is a paper he took out a paper from his pocket and there was some grains and then with the help of that paper he was putting inside you know he threw uh, he poured down through the hole those grains into that square box and what was in the square box we don't know yet but we will find out as we will advance further in the story as Muller did that both the men smiled in a satisfied way both the men smiled in a satisfied way and they looked at each other with smile oh, oh. they looked so happy when they did that and we will find out what exactly they did look out here is someone coming sent flanging uh, said Flanagan, take it down to our berth. We won't need it until tonight and it will be safe there. And Flanagan said, look out, look out, somebody's coming, somebody's coming, somebody's coming. Take it down to our berth, take it down to our berth, hide it. We won't need it until tonight. We are not going to need it until tonight and it will be safe there. Somebody's coming and we don't want anybody to see that. So please hide it under the berth. So they are hiding that box now. It wouldn't do to have anyone suspecting whatever game is or worse still have them fumbling with the box and letting it off by mistake. And they say that, you know, we can't let anybody know about our game. We should not, not, uh, not nobody should get to know about our game. Whatever game is, we should not let, we should not let any Anybody know about that this is what they are talking and the narrator is listening to all these uh, conversations uh, you know can you imagine what he must be thinking he must be thinking that these uh, people are you know not good people these people seem to be bad people to the narrator as he is observing all this and the two men laughed with a cold harsh laugh before uh, bearing the mysterious little box away with them and they laughed before that they hide the bo box and they laughed <laughs> they started to laugh in a strange and mysterious manner maybe they were laughing normally but since the narrator was already suspecting he was already doubting then that's why he found their laughter as mysterious and strange but maybe it is also possible that they were just normally laughing and the two men laughed with the cold. We are done with this. How long I remain sitting on that coil of rope, I shall never know. I tried to recall the words which had been spoken in the terrible dialogue I had overheard. Could these facts lead to any other conclusion? It was clear to me that they were the desperate agents of some group who intended to sacrifice themselves, their fellow passengers and the ship in one great explosion. <coughs> 
so now the narrator is thinking for how long I will keep on hiding here for how long I will keep on sitting here I should do something about it it looks like that they are secret agents and they are going to do some kind of explosion and they are going to uh, kill everybody here they are going to destroy the ship and I should do something about it I can't sit here and do nothing I should do something this is what the narrator is thinking and he is thinking what about the uh, the dialogues the conversation between them which I overheard what if that is true what if that leads to something else what if that leads to some crime so, so the narrator wants to do something about what he heard the whitish grains which I had seen one of them pour into the box no doubt formed the fuse for exploding it I had heard a sound come from the box which might have been emitted by some delicate piece of machinery but what did they mean by tonight could it be that they were putting their horrible design into action on the very first evening of our voyage the mere thought of it sent a cold shudder over me and now the narrator is thinking that while they were pouring uh, through the hole some grains I heard some sound from the box and what what could be that sound was that sound of a machinery was that sound of a time bomb are they going to do this blast in the on you know for a uh, journey on a ship is known as voyage so he is thinking that are they going to do such action such activity on the very first evening of our voyage because i also heard them saying that we were needed to, you know until you know uh, until it's the night time we are not going to need this box that's what I heard them say what did they mean by that this is uh, what is going on in the mind of the narrator during dinner a whirl of conflicting ideas was battling in my mind what was I to, to do what was I to do should I accuse them before both passengers and captain should I demand a few minutes conversation with the latter in his cabin and reveal it at all? Now he's thinking, what can I do about it? Should I accuse them? Should I put an allegation on them? Should I accuse them? Should I, you know, uh, should I say, should I tell everybody that they are doing, they have some evil thing to do uh, and they are going to do this kind of a crime? This is, what going, this is what is going on in their mind. Should I accuse them? Should I complain about them to all the passengers and the captain? Or should I demand a few minutes conversation with the lato means captain, okay? Here this word lato has been used for captain because, you know, as wherever you will see this, uh, I demand a few minutes conversation with the lato in his cabin. Here this lato has been used for this word captain because here we have two uh, this latter has been used for captain as we have two here two subjects here passengers and captain uh, he is referring to passengers also and he is referring to captain also when this word is used this is for the uh, latter one you know second one uh, captain so this is used for captain that should I demand a few minute conversation with the captain in his cabin should I complain about them uh, to the captain in his cabin should I te tell him for an instant, I was half determined to do it, but the thought of becoming observed by all, questioned by a stranger and confronted by the two conspirators was hateful to me. Might it not be possible that I was mistaken? No, I would uh, procrastinate. I would keep my eye on the two men and follow them at every turn. Now, narrator is thinking I'll have to do it I'll have to complain about them to the captain or I'll have to tell every passenger that they are going to do some kind of bomb blast here I'll have I need to talk to the captain I'll talk to the captain in you know in his cabin personally but then he is also thinking what if I am mistaking them what if I am wrong what if they are just normal passengers what if they are not planning any bad thing but if they don't have any evil thing in their mind, I might be wrong. So I should continue to follow them. I should continue to see uh, whatever they are doing. I will continue to observe them. This is what the narrator has decided. I saw the villains heading to the deck after dinner and followed them. I quickly hid my, myself in one of the lifeboats that was hung over the deck. In it, I could reconsider my course of action. 
So the narrator is thinking of, of himself as some kind of detective and you know he's uh, following them and he has been observing them secretly he's uh, you know he's behind them raising my head I could get a view of the two men so he's hiding in the lifeboat and from uh, there he can see uh, the he raising my head I could get a view of the two men from there he could get a view of the two men he could see them both it was so dark that I could hardly make out their figures a few of the passengers were scattered about the deck but many had gone below a strange stillness seemed to pervade the air so there was something strange about the environment there was something strange in the atmosphere and you know I could not really make out and I could not figure out what was in their mind we were to let it off at 10 we were not said a voice from right before right below my boat and I heard the voice that you know we should let it off at around 10 p.m. or we should not do that what should we do should we let it off at 10 and uh, and overhearing this narrator is you know he's, uh, he's he started to doubt again yes at 10 sharp we have eight minutes yet and the other man replied oh okay at 10 sharp we have eight minutes left after eight minutes we will let it off so what's inside the square box they will hear the drop of the trigger one day they will hear the drop of the trigger one day and they are talking about other passengers now it doesn't matter it will be too late for anyone to prevent is it's going off it won't matter if they will hear because it, it will be too late for the people to prevent it from happening because it will be too late of course and they won't be able to stop it there was a pause here then i heard muller's voice in a ghastly whisper there's only five minutes more and uh, Muller says and he heard the voice of Muller who is Muller the, sh the short man the one who is short in height he says there's only five minutes there's only five minutes more has how, how slowly the moments seemed to pass I could count them by the throbbing of my heart it will make a sensation on land said a voice and he heard another voice it might be either the Flanagan the tall guy or Muller the short guy that it's going to make a sensation on land yes it will make a noise in the newspaper and it will be the news about what we are going to do will be in the newspaper tomorrow how great that would be or you know it was going to be in the newspaper this is what they are talking and the narrator is listening to all this the deck the deck was deserted now save for those two dark figures crouching in the shadows there seemed no hope no help death stared me in the face whether i did or did not give the alarm now the narrator is thinking the deck is empty it's just those two guys on the deck and me and i am about to die i am facing my death you know i am face to face with my death and i can't do anything about it whether i do the alarming thing or i don't whether i alert other people or i don't it's for sure now that I'm going to die because they are going to do that explosion or whatever the evil that they have in their mind this is that de deck area on the ship this is what we call deck and here is the little square box and what do we see here uh, this is narrator and these are the two men what is happening here we will find out as we will read three minutes more Flanagan said put it down up on the deck it was a little square box I knew by the sound that they had placed it almost exactly under my head a minute and a half more Flanagan said shall you or I pull the string I will pull it said Muller I could stand on it I could stand it no longer my nervous system seemed to give away in a moment so this is the conversation between Flanagan and Muller they are talking about it that we just have three minutes left we are about to let it go we are about to let it off or you are going to pull the string or I will okay I will pull it uh, Muller says that I will pull the string you don't worry about it and then that's when the narrator decided that this is it I can't take it anymore that's it this is the point where I am taking a stand where I am going to stand out so the narrator has decided to uh, take it you know he's going to voice out and because his nervous system seemed to give away and he screamed stop I screamed, springing to my feet stop stop 
That's how he's uh, screaming. They both staggered backwards. I imagine they thought I was a spirit with the moonlight streaming down upon my pale face. And they, uh, they thought of the narrator as some spirit, as some Atma, because uh, moonlight was uh, coming from behind him and he was uh, on the way uh, between, you know, he, moonlight coming from the back. Here, two people, and between them, standing the narrator. So it lo he he's lo almost looking like a spirit. I was brave enough now. I had gone too far to stop. And he was the narrator says that he is brave enough now, and he's doing his best to stop. Would you have the blood of two hundred upon your souls? I cried. And he said, "Are you? Would you have the blood of two hundred people? Are you going to, you know, take the lives of two hundred people? Are you that cruel? Are you that bad?" He is asking them. He is mad. Said Flanagan. Time's up. Let it off, Muller. And Flanagan says, Flanagan stops him, as we see in the picture, that Flanagan is stopping him. And he said to the Miller, "He is mad. Just don't pay attention to him." and let it off for him. you know let it off whatever we have in the box let it off now i sprang down upon the deck you shouldn't do it i said it's no business of yours clear out of this never said i and you know he said he's asking them don't do it you should not do it i won't let you do it and the flanagan says it's none of your business mind your own business and he says no 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 i'm going to stop you no matter what it takes i'm not going to let you do this he, never I will allow you to do this. Never I won't let it. I won't let you do this. Never he, he says. Confound the fellow. I'll hold him, Muller, while you pull the trigger. And the the, the tall guy Flanagan uh, says that I'm going to hold him here. You pull the trigger. Don't worry about him. Next moment, I was struggling in the Herculean grasp of the man. He pinned me up against the side of the vessel and held me there. I saw the other approach, the fatal box. He stooped over it and seized the string. Then came a sharp snap, a strange rasping noise. The trigger had fallen. The side of the box flew out and let off two gray carrier pigeons. So <clears throat> he is now, uh, you know, he, he is struggling in the Herculean grasp of the man, which means very strong grasp of the tall man. And he is struggling, let me go, let me go, let, let me go. That tall man is not letting him go. And he sees the Muller, that, that man Muller, he, he's, uh, you know, about to trigger the box. He's about to open that little square box. And from that little box, two gray pigeons, they flew out. They were the things which these two men hiding. Neither bomb nor guns. It was just pigeons. There were two pigeons inside that box. Here is an extract clipped from the column of the New York Herald shortly after our departure from America. Extraordinary pigeon flying a novel which has been pulled off the last week between the birds of John. Now this is uh, more detail about the story. The story is over here. Uh, the narrator was thinking of himself as some detective and you know it was obvious for him also to doubt because of the behavior put up by the strangers by those two men. So he had started to doubt, he had started to suspect and he continued to follow them and observe them and he, in the end he found out that uh, you know he was, he was wrong, he was uh, mistaking them and you know his uh, perception, his observation was wrong. In, in the little square box there were only two pigeons and wh why uh, they were carrying two grey pigeons in the little square box we will find out as we will read here the detail. Uh, Last week between the uh, uh, a novel match, a novel match has been pulled off last week between the birds of John H. Flanagan of Boston. The tall guy Flanagan, he's from Boston and there was a, uh, it was going to be a match, a race between the bird of Flanagan who is from Boston and Jeremiah Miller, a well-known citizen of Lowell. The start was from the deck of the ship Spartan. So there, that, that was the starting point of the race. The race, that, it's, you know, it was just a race. The race was taking place between the birds of these two men. 
At 10 o'clock on the evening of the day of starting, the vessel being about 100 miles from land, the bird which reached home first was to be declared the winner. Considerable caution had to be observed as some captains have a prejudice against the organization of sporting events aboard their ships. The pigeons were confined in a speci specially invented trap which could only be opened by a spring. It was possibly to feed them through an opening in the top. In spite of a little difficulty at the last uh, moment, the trap was sprung, open almost exactly at 10 o'clock. Uh, Muller's bird reached land in an extreme state of exhaustion on the following morning. While Fenningans has not been heard of, a few such matches would go far towards popularizing pigeon flying in America. So it's an old story where people used to do this uh, racing kind of thing between their birds. Uh, this was their plan. They carried their pigeons, they carried their birds on the ship and it was going to be a race, it was going to be a match between the two birds, between the pigeon of Flanagan, the tall guy, and Muller, the short guy. Who won the race? The pigeon of the short guy, uh, Muller, uh, you know, Muller's pigeon. That pigeon won the race and the pigeon of the tall guy, Flanagan, uh, you know, that pigeon was not able to reach off Muller, uh, reached to the destination, reached to the position, reached to the place where uh, the pigeon was supposed to in the... Uh, when did the pigeon reach? Next morning, the pigeon reached to the place where it was supposed to. But, but why were they hiding it? Because it was not allowed to carry and it was not allowed such uh, events of sports, such events of bird racing, was not allowed during that time so that's why they had to hide those pigeons in the little square box and the square bo box was also very special uh, there was a hole from uh, you know they used to pour down those grains to feed the pigeons and it would only open uh, you know the trap was sprang up open all, almost exactly at 10 o'clock exactly at 10 o'clock which was the time that they had decided and it could only be opened by a spring there was a spring kind of a thing uh, attached with the box and with the help of that spring uh, the box was going to be they were going to open the box with the help of that spring which was attached in the box so it was not an ordinary box it was uh, an extraordinary and specially invented box so this was all about the story now, what have we learned from this story today that we should not unnecessarily uh, doubt or suspect although uh, you know precautions uh, you know being careful is a good thing but you know we should not unnecessarily doubt people are you ready to mark the internal question and answers let's begin question number one what kind of man the speaker is the answer of this question is found in the beginning at you know right here the speaker is a nervous man traveling from America to England. Uh, I request you to mark this answer right here in your book. The speaker is a nervous man traveling from America to England. Then second one, where did the author hide? Where did the author hide? If you were paying attention, I'm sure you'll be able to tell. It's on page number 120, paragraph number 24. The answer of this question is found on paragraph number 24, page number 120. Okay, here is our paragraph number 24. The question is, where did the author hide? And the answer, in one of the life boards that was hung over the deck. Okay, here the author was hiding. This is the answer of the question. Now the third one and the last one. Which bird was to be declared the winner? Which bird was to be declared the winner? The answer of this third and final question is found on page number 123 and paragraph number 50. I repeat page number 123 and paragraph number 50. The answer is here. Bird which reached home first was to be declared the winner. Please mark the answer here. This is your internal question number three. All right. So this is it for today. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you very soon again. I really enjoyed spending this time with you. Peace be with you. God bless you.